Hello everyone, here we are. We're going to get going. We're going to continue with Job in chapter 38. So here we go. All right. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and I will question I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together? That's a reference to all the angels singing. He's saying, you know, were you there when I did all this? And all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where, here is where your proud, okay, Hold on, I'm going to read that again. When I fixed limits for it, speaking about the sea, the ocean, and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. So he's truly talking about the wicked here and giving his own answer regarding the wicked. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You've lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? or seen the storehouses of the hail? Remember, we were talking about that, and I told you the book of Enoch really talks about these things. Which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle. What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, excuse me, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs, meaning uh, Ursa uh, constellation? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourselves with a, yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. You know, this is funny because it almost sounds like God is describing playing in his creation. At one point he says, have you walked in the deepest depths? Which means the Lord has been at the bottom of the ocean walking and looking. And here he's saying, 
have you covered and you know can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water do you send the lightning bolts on their way do they report to you here we are who gives the ibis wisdom you know the ibis was the goat that the egyptians loved to worship and it's quite beautiful or gives the rooster understanding who has the wisdom to count the clouds who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it the wasteland as its home, the salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion in the town. It doesn't hear a driver's shout. It ranges the hills for its pasture and searches for any green thing. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will it stay by your manger at night? Can you hold it to the furrow with a harness? Will it till the valleys behind you? Behind you? That's interesting. Instead of in front of you, behind you. In other words, it's going to do it, you know, like on its own, I think. Will you rely on it for its great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to it? Can you trust it to haul in your grain and bring it to your threshing floor? So this is what he's saying. I think he's saying, I made the ox to serve you. The way, but, but it's by me. You didn't make it this way. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they can't compare with the wings and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God didn't endow her with wisdom. He's talking about the ostrich. Or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. And the ostrich does run very fast, doesn't it? Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane? Do you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength and charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It doesn't shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side, along with the flashing spear and lance. In frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It can't stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts, Aha! It catches the scent of battle from afar, the shout of commanders and the battle cry. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings towards the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on, it dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold. From there it looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood. And where the slain are, there it is. The Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? So let's read that again. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's and can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. 
Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. I told you the Lord is not with the wicked. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Okay. So he's saying, if you can do all these things, then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. That your own right hand can save you. If you can do all those things. Do you have an arm like God? Can you adorn yourself with glory and splendor? Can you clothe yourself in honor and majesty? Can you look at all the proud and bring them low? Can you humble them, make them like dust, shroud their faces in the grave? Well, then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Look at behemoth. That means like a whale, something huge, which I made along with you and which feeds on grass like an ox. Okay, some people think this is a dinosaur, okay? like a brontosaurus. We don't know. I mean, there's plenty of people out there that believe that man was here when the dinosaurs were, and we certainly have hieroglyphics of dinosaurs. I mean, they're as clear as day. The stegosaurus, brontosaurus, they're all there in hier hieroglyphics. So there is a question, okay? I'm not gonna answer that question because I don't know, okay? Uh, so I guess it's not a whale because it says here, look at behemoth, which I made along with you and which feeds on grass like an ox. Now we know the brontosaurus ate grass and a lot of others did too. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are close knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs like rods of iron. It ranks first among the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with his sword. In other words, the Lord has control over these things. Now we always say that dinosaurs were before man. He's saying it ranks first among the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with the sword. I'm going to tell you something. I went to the New York uh, Museum of Natural History where all the big skeletons of the dinosaurs are. And when I looked at the uh, brontosaurus, I recognized God because the bones were like, they, the way they were put together, it was like a human skeleton. It didn't look like a human skeleton, but it was the same designer. And I looked and I saw God. I said, oh my Lord, it was really a revelation, okay? Because he has a style and you recognize it. Same person who made them made us. Uh, the hills bring it their produce and all the wild animals play nearby. Sounds like a brontosaurus that doesn't eat meat. Under the lotus plant it lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal it in their shadow. The poplars by the stream surround it. A raging river doesn't alarm it. It's secure, though the Jordan should surge against its mouth. Can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook? Okay, Leviathan is the, um, you know, some people say it's sea serpents. And in those days, maybe it was. I mean, all of our um, uh, myths and fables and fairy tales, they all come from somewhere, okay? Uh, we don't know what happened thousands of years ago. We just don't. But it says here, can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook? So we know it's either a huge whale or a sea serpent, something like that. Or tie down its tongue with a rope. I mean, obviously Job knows what he's talking about. Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of it like a bird or put it on a leash for the young women in your house? Will traders barter for it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember, remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. So this could be a sea dinosaur also. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. I'll not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? 
Who can penetrate its double coat of armor? You know, there's also a thought, uh, you know, we hear a lot about dragons and there's that thought that perhaps there were dragons. I mean, what do we know? What do we really know, okay? Uh, but here it is out of God's mouth. He's talking about something that we may not have here anymore, thankfully, based on what it sounds like. <laughs> All right. Uh, who can penetrate its double coat of armor? Who dares open the doors of its mouth? Ringed about with fearsome teeth. Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. So this sounds like a sea monster or some kind of sea dragon. I don't know. It has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. They're joined fast to one another. They cling together and can't be parted. It's snorting, throws out flashes of light. Okay, we may have gone from Leviathan to a dragon. La 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 la, can you fill it with harpoons? No, okay. Uh, can you pull in Leviathan with a fish? I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength and its graceful form. So it's got a graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can penetrate its double coat of armor? Now this is a new paragraph, so I don't know if this is another type of, of Leviathan that the Lord is talking about, but this one, uh, snorts fire. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. That sounds like a dragon to me. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets coal ablaze and flames dart from its mouth. Strength resides in its neck. Dismay goes before it. I'll bet. The folds of its flesh are tightly joined. They're firm and immovable. Its chest is hard as a rock, as rock, hard as a lower millstone, the big one. When it rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before its thrashing. The sword that reaches it has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron, it treats like straw. So this is something very mighty. And bronze like rotten wood, arrows do not make it flee. Sling stones are like chaff to it. A club seems to it, to it, but a piece of straw. It laughs at the rattling of the lance. Its undersides are jagged pot, pots, pot shirt. I think that's, I think pots herds, P-O-T-S-H-E-R-D-S. I think it's shards of pottery. Its undersides are jagged potsherds, or potsherds, pot, I don't know how to pronounce it, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. So when it walks, it looks like, the, the marks that it leaves looks like something was threshing it, like a threshing sledge. It makes the depths chum like a boiling cauldron. Okay, so maybe this is something that can go into the water also. So maybe the sea serpent can come up on land. Uh, it stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a glistening wake behind it. One would think the deep had white hair. This is quite a description of something. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. It looks down on all that are haughty. It is king over all that are proud. Then Job replied to the Lord. So what I get out of all of that is I'm God and I can do whatever I want. Once again, it's a statement of sovereignty. So we can discourse over and over about what we think the Lord is saying here and there. It doesn't mean we can't discern it. It just means that if we don't like it, it doesn't matter because he's God and he's going to do whatever he wants to. Now, this doesn't make him a creep. This makes him God. Okay, now a lot of people want to put God in a box and say, oh, my God wouldn't do that. My God, the God I believe in would never create hell. Well, that's no God at all. That's somebody that you're imagining and making up. But God is God and we have to take him on his terms. He can do whatever he wants. Okay, and by the way, just to remind you, hell was never created for man. It was created for the fallen angels. But when you make a decision to not go stay with God, then you have to go stay with the devil and his abode is hell. Or it will be. Okay. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So he's bowing low here. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. 
things too wonderful for me to know because he trusts God and knows that God is good. So even if we don't understand something, the be all and end all of God is that he's good. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Poor Job. Basically, what the Lord just said to him is, How dare you, little man? You were created. I've made all these wonders. I control everything. And you're up here high and mighty with your friends having this argument about me and what I do. And you all need to know that it's just, you know, it's useless conjecture. It's just an argument, okay? His friends weren't very nice to him. Okay, and God just put all five of them to the floor and just said, look, you guys are talking about stuff you don't know. You're talking about my character trying to rip me apart, and we know God's character is good. All right, so here's the epilogue of Job. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends. Because you've not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So even if Job was caught in a strange, you know, in an ignorant discourse, he still had more knowledge of the Lord. He was in that thing that's below normal hitting the bottom. I mean, he's really suffering and he's caught in his circumstance and only God can change it. And these guys are blaming him. Okay? So I told you the Lord was going to rebuke, or I didn't tell you he was going to rebuke them, but I knew he was going to, and here it is. I'm angry with you and your two friends because you've not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you. And I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Defense against people who are cruel and ignorant and don't just sit down and under, you know, who can't understand. And so they start talking out of their pride instead of just sitting down and being a comfort and shutting up. Um... I will not deal with you according to your folly. You haven't spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namatite, did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuk. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job, after this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. So that would be your great, 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 great grandchildren, I think. And so Job died an old man and full of years. And that's that. I love you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.